This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At FilmmakerU.com, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Instagram at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional, and this week, I'm joined by editor William Goldenberg, uh, whose work includes Argo, Zero Dark Thirty, and more recently, Air for Prime Video. Welcome to the show, William. So I guess to start off, you've... You, You've worked with uh, Ben Affleck before as a director, and I'm wondering um, at what stage now does he come to you to uh, get you involved with it? Are you helping him with giving feedback on the scripts, or where where does he enter, and how did you get involved in this film? Well, I mean, in, you know, everyone is different. Um, you know, this one came up came up really fast. You know, um, it was. I can't remember how far out, maybe just like five weeks or something, you know, and he, I have this script and I'm going to make, you know, told me the story of the movie. I was like, uh, you know, I'm in, I did, I hadn't, and he was, they were still working on the script. So he didn't send it to me for a couple more weeks. In fact, he sent me the original script. And then before I even had a chance to open it, um, he said, no, don't read that one. Here's the new one, you know, and they were only a few weeks out from shooting uh, and they were, mm -hmm. it was a really fast prep. So this one, I didn't really contribute anything to the script because, you know, they, he and Matt were working with Alex uh, on it. And, you know, that's a pretty good trio. And, um, yeah. and, you know, I, like I said, there wasn't really much time to do it. And um, so I came on, like I said, I mean, I would almost, it would be really hard to imagine a situation where Ben offered me a movie and I didn't do it because his tastes are so similar to mine and his sensibility is similar to mine. So, and we have such a great, relationship working relationship uh that you know i would uh, he would if he called me and said i have a movie i can't tell you what it is i'd still do it um because i know it would be something i like my friends and i would make little videos um, in our backyards you know imitations of indiana jones and star wars and, you know eventually that need to tell stories became more of a technical interest and an interest in the, the art To me, what's exciting is using cinema in its full potential, which is rhythm and sound design and music. Our job is to set up expectations and then deliver on them. I'm Brian Cates, and this is my course in film editing. Well, and so one of my questions is like, there this is based on real people mm -hmm. and there are a few things that uh, that are altered in it or like certain storylines might be changed so like when you're when you guys are working on it is there discussion about that about you know where how far to push a certain story element or pull it back based on reality yeah i mean i without giving specifics there will be i mean you know, all, I, I've done a lot of true stories and I'm always asking, is this how it happened? Is this how, is this real? Is this how it happened? You know, because, you know, you, like anybody, you're curious. And, um, you know, I think that, I think when, you know, you veer from the, what the, the absolute truth of something, as long as you keep, you know, I always feel like as long as you keep it in the spirit of the truth, mm -hmm. you know, the way the, the, the people, the real people intended whether it's not whether whether it's not a sort of beat by beat exact yeah. you know recount of it i i think it's the spirit of it i always feels I'm, I'm always comfortable with that um and the biggest you know howard white saw the film you know and before phil did phil knight did and he watched it three times in a row and loved it so we felt like okay and then um when phil saw it you know he mentioned a couple of things that were altered but he said but he loved the film and felt like it it captured the only the first film he said that captured the real nike culture the way it was back mm -hmm. then and he said even though there was a couple of things altered that it felt right for the film and it right for the spirit of the film and the spirit of what happened so that i'm comfortable with that i i don't you know 
I don't know. I mean, not that I could do much about it once I signed on to the film, but I don't know how comfortable I feel if you like really veered off and like, yeah. you know, I mean, I even, uh, even uh, films, I, f I have done that. I mean, I, now that I think about it, the imitation game, we, we, there's even more, you know, I would say 60% of that film is true and air is much closer to a hundred than that. So, you know, um, as long as we don't defame anyone, it feels like, you know, is how, how do you, cause the, the tricky part is we all know the ending. So we're coming into this movie already knowing what that, how it's going to go. So how did, how did you approach this film or how did you approach it so that we were still gripped? Because I was going in being like, I already know the ending. And then about halfway through, I was like on the edge of my seat, sort of like what's going to happen next. Well, I think, I think, it, it, you know, first of all, I, I think we, Ben and I both pretend we don't know the end of the film, you know what I mean? So we're, uh, we're operating as if the ending is a surprise. And so the idea is to, you know, the, it, a combination of pace and also getting the audience really deep into the characters and what they're going through that hopefully you have them, you know, you have them captured in a way that they they forget it they're they're so in the movie that they don't think about like mm -hmm. oh i know the ending you know, this is going to happen so they you know you you have to really you know between the writing and the acting and the editing and the production design and everything that you have to you know if the audience is gripped about what's happening in front of them they're not thinking about anything else so that i mean that's a tall order you know, often but you know, luckily for in this film, it, it was, you know, it's great performances and and great writing. And so people are just in the moment and they, you know, so what it, they're not thinking ahead. They're thinking about what they're watching. So, you know, that's a combination of all those different things, music and, you know, everything to, to keep the audience on the edge of their seat. Same thing in Argo, like everybody knew they got out at the end, but, you know, yeah. you hope they're so in the moment with those characters that, you know, that that's all they're thinking about. One of the things I was going to ask is like in the film, it seems like uh, Ben Affleck in this film in particular uh, did a lot of camera movements. So a lot of camera sort of tracking dollies pushing in. Mm -hmm. So when you're working, because like I think about that first argument or not the first, sorry, the first sort of discussion between um, the two characters right after the opening. The, you mean uh, Chris Tucker and Matt walking through the bullpen? Like yes. Uh, well, they're in his office, though. Well, they're in his office, and they walk all yeah. the way. To the okay, meeting. yeah, yeah. And there's, like, all this movement. So I'm wondering, like, when you get footage where, you know, some of it's static and some of it's uh, moving, like, how do you deal with pacing? Because that's going to have its own sort of trajectory or feeling to it. Well, I mean, in that particular, you know, the ca you know, it's Bob Richardson. So, <laughs> you know, the, the camera work and the, you know, so... You know, when when there's you're working with somebody who's a master like that, the camera, mm -hmm. the acting, and the storytelling all sort of really meshes into one thing. So that's sort of done almost for me. But you know, you use like cutting from a moving camera to a static camera. You know, you you do it to create a you know a result. Like mm -hmm. well, like it's, it's going to be a hard edge cut. So you know, what do you want? So you use that to to an effect. You know, to to you know to really I mean you can jar somebody with that moving to moving, you know, you try and make it flow together so that it, you know, feels seamless. It, it almost like is one cuts pushing the other cut, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the energy of the A side pushes the B side of the cut. And that's what I'm always trying to do unless I'm trying to be more noticeable about it to, to, to make a story point. So you just use it, you use those things to your advantage and, you know, hopefully the audience doesn't know it, but they feel it, you know, and yeah. that's our job. It's my job, you know, so it's, a lot of that is just like, either instinctual or trial and error or like, oh, I can, you know, when I'm watching the dailies, I've been doing this for so long, I'll see, oh, in this moment, I like, if I did that, it would be, you know, really, you know, really sell that story point without being too overt about it. And so that, you know, I'm looking for that kind of stuff. You know, I'm, when I'm watching the scene, the dailies for scenes, I've reread that scene and the scenes around it three, four, five times already. So then in my head is looking for pieces that are going to help tell those story beats and something, you know, I'll see those bits and, 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 and make, you know, write them down and then, and then use them to help tell the story. Interesting. When you're looking at the script, do you make any particular notes or dissect it in any way or highlight anything, or do you leave it sort of blank and 
No, I kind of leave it blank, but I reread and reread and reread is what I do because whenever I'm starting a new scene, because you know they don't shoot in continuity, so you're you're going from the scene in the beginning to the scene in the end, and then the scene in the middle, and so I just keep rereading, you know, 10, 15 pages before, 10, 15 pages after. So I really have my mind, you know, exactly where each character is in the story, you know, story-wise, and then and more importantly, almost is emotionally, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, I find that, you know, the best way to grip an audience is to tell the each character's emotional story, like, and then look for footage when i'm studying the dailies that will tell that emotional story what is that guy going what is that the man or woman going through at that particular moment you know mm-hmm. and then looking for moments that that illustrate that and oftentimes nonverbal. um and the great thing about air is because there's so many phone calls and you know you find you know when you're on a phone with somebody they can't see you so you can act in a whole different way than you're sounding. Yeah. You know, what? like for instance, when Dolores is listening to Matt on that one phone call and she just takes the receiver and holds it away from her for a minute because she just doesn't want to hear it, you know? And you can't do that. Like, it would be like turning your back on somebody in a conversation. So the phone calls, you know, gives the actors the ability to do things physically that they wouldn't be able to do if they were in person. So it really adds like a whole another element of storytelling that you wouldn't have in a normal dialogue scene. Now, is there a particular scene or moment in the film that was your favorite to cut or gave you a bit of a challenge or anything? Um, well, the two hard, the two most challenging scenes were um, the boardroom when, when Nike pitches the Jordan family, that was certainly the most challenging um and really rewarding because we worked and worked and worked and worked on it and kept changing the amount of video you know uh, archival footage that we were using <clears throat> excuse me um you know originally the script called for Matt's almost Matt's dialogue to be almost like voiceover like mm-hmm. the once so I'm going to I'm going to tell you the future and it was more like a video montage of Michael Jordan's future but then we realized it sort of became like a highlight film, you know, it, it was not, it was cool to look at it. It was really, it was really interesting, but it wasn't telling the the emotional story we needed to tell. And Matt was so good in the dailies. We kept, ben and I were like, why are we not watching Matt? You know, why are we watching, you know, more and more stuff of Michael playing basketball or Michael playing baseball. And so we realized that those those needed to be more snapshots, mm-hmm. you know, more glimpses of the things that were going to happen. And it was, it was much more, that was, so it kept the movie much more rooted in that room. And, uh, and then, you know, the, if the audience wants to see a highlight film, they can go on YouTube, you know? So we, yeah. we made that, we, we kept thinning it down and thinning it down about how much video or archival material we showed. And that was a real, that was a real process. Like, you know, and, um, we had to add, we added a couple of like a line or two to sort of make things flow a little bit better and and you know and and finding just the right reactions of Dolores and James um were you know it was really and you know all the people around the table and what are they going through and especially Phil what's he you know what's he feeling during all this so you know all, any scene where you have that many people around the table is always challenging anyway yeah um, probably the most rewarding scene I did was the scene um, when Matt rushes in in the morning after seeing Michael make that shot over and over, you know, when he's rewinding and rewinding. And he comes in and he tells Jace, uh, Jason Bateman's character, uh, Rob Strasser, you know, I found him. And he's like, and he pulls the video card over and he's showing him how the play was drawn up for Michael. And well, the night before they were going to shoot that Ben and Matt came into my office and they realized the way the script was it really we don't we didn't have the video we didn't have the footage to support that the archival footage to support what the script said because it just didn't exist and Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to come up with a different idea for like what that scene was what he was going to be showing Jason on the on the video so we started looking we started you know you know Matt and Ben were kicking around ideas and I would chime in a little bit and and finally they came up we came up with this idea that the shot was 
you know, drawn up for Jordan and that Worthy was a decoy and um, and that Michael was calling for the ball, which is true. Yeah. But, you know, but um, so then Matt went on the set that day and he he kind of improv a lot of the dialogue and he did a lot of takes and a lot of different takes and he felt really and I didn't even know this until later but Ben told me that Matt felt re- he was like okay we have to you know at the end of the night he said Ben wanted to do a couple more takes and he said now nah, we gotta have to come back and redo this this is not gonna this is not working um you know uh and Matt was, Ben was like no no I think it's good I think it's good just let Billy take a shot at it <laughs> and um so Matt did a couple more takes and, you know, and there were good bits here and there. And, and I took all that footage and made the scene as it is right now. I think it, I'm pretty, it's, I think it's, there are no, we took a, a line or two out yeah. when the second part of it, but, but it's basically my first cut. And so that when I showed it to Matt that day, I've, I've never felt, I almost never felt as rewarded as I did that moment because he was just, he was so happy and so thrilled that the scene worked so well. And he, you know, I, he gave me more credit than I deserved because I was just like, you're a really good actor. You know, I got to say this to him, but you know, he's an amazing actor and and he yeah. just, he never felt secure about it, but I saw it when I saw the mm-hmm. dailies and it seemed obvious to me what to do. And so when, when they both literally the next day, they saw it, I cut it the next day and they saw it later that night. And, and they loved it. And that, so that was really a, that was really a special moment. When you were cutting it, did, cause you said he ad lib, did you build like steel from the different takes and build a new sort of line or? No, not, not too much. Be? Yeah. I mean, I've done that in the past. Now this was, when I say ad lib, he was like, cha- he would, ch- it was not like completely different. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, he was, he was changing the words, but he a little here, a little there. And you know, maybe telling a little more, a little less. So it was just, you know, you just using what I thought was the right bits to to sell the to sell the thing to Rob, to Jason Bateman's character. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was like going over, you know, like Jim Carrey improving, but <laughs> but um, but he was, you know, he did a fair amount of uh, you know improvisation. But um, but I didn't have to. Ma- I've done that with Chris Tucker a little. Sometimes I manufactured some sentences. Um, and that opening scene with Chris, yeah, he, uh, that was a lot. Chris improved almost his whole, when I say improv, he, um, he spent a lot of time with the real Howard White, who is in, uh, like, he's just like that in person. Yeah. Uh, Cause I've met him a few times too. And he's a real character and they really do call him the, they call him the pre- a, a preacher. Um, he's just full of stories and all those stories that Chris Tucker tells are right out of Howard's mouth. Wow. And um, and he was just like, you know, that opening scene, there was just hours and hours of footage of Chris and it was just all amazing. So that to shape that into like a, like a three minute scene or a two, whatever it ended up being was really challenging to make that and to make Matt's reactions work with it. And it, it was really fun, but it was challenging. And there I did have to like, you know, make a couple of sentences that didn't exist. Yeah. Well, and I, I really appreciate that Chris Tucker was in this because it's been a while since I've seen him in a film. And I was just so he's such a great, uh, fun actor to watch. What were the rushes like? So like you're talking, you've had this amazing career where you get to watch some of the best actors in the world perform. What were the rushes in this like? Like what were you getting a wide variety of uh, differences or was it much more sort of muted and controlled sort of like Ben knew what he was going for? It depended on the actor. Um, like Chris Messina, I got a lot of variety. You know, he would he would do sc- the scripted dialogue, and then he would go veer off one way or another, and then like and do like and it would get maybe bigger as he went along. Like the scene where he's screaming at Matt on the phone. There's lots of different versions of that, and mm-hmm. a lot some of that was in improvisation, and and some of it wasn't like the thing where he like the way he's got the sword on his that, that little that big knife on his desk that he just grabbed up from, you know, it was, it was part of set dressing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just grabbed it and started messing around with it. So he gave me lots of different variety. Ben improv some, you know, uh, Matt a little bit, but not so much, you know, every act, Chris Tucker a ton. Um, so it depended. And, and, and Viola's dailies were as you'd expect, you know, they, they were incredible. It was uh, like a editor's bucket list, you know, to, yeah. to edit something where Viola Davis is in it. And I was, you know, and 
I mean, Ben's told the story, but Michael, Michael Cass Viola, you know, um, yeah. uh, he, uh, Ben went down to see him and he says, Michael Jordan's got to play my mom. And it's like, well, I mean, I'll ask her, but it doesn't work like that. And luckily yeah. she said yes. And she was so perfect. Um, well, I didn't even, if they didn't put the card at the head of the film saying that she was in this, it wouldn't have clicked for me. She was so immersed in that character um, yeah. compared to what I've seen in other, like, other films it's more um obvious i guess you could say but in this one she was really she just disappeared into the role i know that's the great i love don't you love films like that where you yeah. you know somebody's in it and at the end you go wait a second who did so-and-so play and you go yeah. oh my god you know that's that kind of thing yeah i mean like i said there's certain actors you know i can check her off now that you know what i mean it, it, and then you know the same thing goes for jason i love jason i loved ozark and yeah I mean, I was so excited that he was in it and and uh, and obviously Viola and um, Christmas scene I've known personally for a long time. And he's a wonderful guy. I was very excited to work with him again. So and even Matt Mayer, who plays um, the sneaker designer, is, you know, he and Matt and Ben went to, I think, elementary school together. Oh, no way. Yeah, he's a he's a really wonderful actor. You know, he works all the time and but he's always in one of Ben's movies. And he was so perfect in that role. Mm -hmm. Uh and uh yeah they just did such an extraordinary job of casting you know it makes it makes you know i was never trying to like make a performance it was all, mm -hmm. always like it was always trying to elevate what was already great you know and, yeah. and try to really make it sing and that's a real pleasure of, as an editor is when you get material that you can it's already working and you can really make something out of it or as opposed to just like can I make this releasable? You know, that kind of thing. And and it, it's, it's it, to have all this like a wealth of material like that. That's when it's you know, my job is the most fun. Was there any, you know, cause and by the sense, the sense I get from it when I watch it, is the answer is going to be no, but in a lot of films, you can, you know, you'll move things around and try and re refine the structure a bit. So I'm wondering, was there any changes to the, the story in the cutting room or any uh, adjustments to the structure? Very little. Um, the only thing that we did, <clears throat> excuse me, the little um, high school basketball scene in the opening and the little mm -hmm. and the Vegas and the Vegas thing where he's gambles and loses his money. That used to be in the body of the film. Um, but it didn't it didn't we never even really even put it. It was scripted to be in the body of the film, but we all knew and Matt especially knew that it didn't belong there, that we needed to know that material know that information before we before we got into the body of the story that Sonny is a gambler that Sonny is a high school basketball scout and you have to you want to see him do that and then hear about it as opposed to hear about it and then see it so um that got moved into the opening and I think to much of the film you know made the film much better otherwise the structure was pretty sound you know and we only I think we only lost one scene in the whole movie you know that um it turned out that we just didn't need, but um, the script was really tight. And so we never, you know, we never had a length problem. And so we never, and, and every scene was integral. So, you know, in movies where you can, I find that movies where you can move scene, a lot of scenes around, yeah. it's probably not a good thing, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if it doesn't matter what order they go in. It's probably yeah. not a good thing. <laughs> Well, but it's interesting that that scene went to the start because I, when I was watching, I was like, this is a great intro because it's literally, it's like, here's the guy. He says, thanks to him, says his name. Then we see his addiction to gambling that we see him come to. So it sets the whole character background. Up. Exactly. It just seems such a, when Matt said it, it was such a natural, we were, you know, it was like Ben and I were both like, oh yeah, of course, you know, uh, perfect. You know, it just was, you know, when sometimes when somebody has an idea and it's so good that you think, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why didn't I think of that? You know, and and it really it made it made the opening have much more obviously have more story than just you know flavor. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Um, now we've done interviews before, so I've already asked you about your guilty pleasure film. But is there a film? What would you say was the film that was the most fun to work on? Um, I would probably have to say Gone Baby Gone, although the film itself is not you know, when you'd think, well, that was fun. But, um, but it's the first time I worked with Ben and I was nervous about it because, you know, he's an, he was an actor and he never directed. And, and then we had such a good time and it, it was 
Disney made the movie through Miramax, which they owned at the time. And um, we kind of they kind of left us alone. It was a $20 million film. It's not the kind of movie the studio made. And and we just got to do what we wanted. You know, it was just the two of us in the room, like doing like making a movie unsupervised, you know, and um, I don't know, it was the beginning of a route. What I could tell was going to be a really great relationship. He's a really fun person to be around. And and it was just nice to have like to, to do it, you know, without interference i guess you know without the studio be breathing down our necks or i don't know it, just, it felt very freeing and it felt like i really was contributing and um we you know we, we had a great crew it was just one of those things where everything clicked and was similar i mean i had i, I would i could almost say the same thing about air you know it was mm -hmm. we all we made the movie i can't remember if i mentioned we the production office the set and the editing were all in the same building in santa monica and so it was like everybody was there all the time. You know, I'd open my door and there was the wardrobe department or the video village was like right outside my door where they shot the boardroom scene right next door to my editor, my assistant's room. And we had, she had to like put headphones on and work quietly so she wouldn't, you know, so it was, it was this sort of, it was like making a film in a big dorm, college dorm, yeah. where everybody was living there, you know, I mean, we and so it was it, that also the film was really, really fun. So, I mean, it's no coincidence that a lot of my fun experiences are with Ben. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview today. My pleasure. And thank you. Well, that's it for our show this week. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. And of course, follow us on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.